The Watsons Go to Birmingham, 1963, written by Christopher Paul Curtis. Welcome back to Chapter 2 in The Watsons Go to Birmingham. The chapter is called Give My Regards to Clark Poindexter. And when we left off, <clears throat> Kenny had gone into a fifth grade classroom to read out loud. And it wasn't just any fifth grade class. It was his older brother Byron's fifth grade class. And he really kind of outshined his brother. He really looks like he's a smart kid. And when we left off, um, Byron and Kenny were out in the playground after school. Let's pick up and find out what happens. I didn't even get out of the schoolyard before Byron and Buphead caught up to me. A little crowd had bunched up around us, and everybody was really excited because they knew I was about to get jacked up. Buphead said, Here's that little egghead punk. Leave the clown alone, Byron said. It's a crying shame, taking him around like a circus freak. He punched me kind of hard in the arm and said, at least you ought to make them pay you for paying you for doing that mess. If it was me, they'd come out of their pockets with folding money every time they took me around. I couldn't believe it. I think Byron was proud of me. When everybody saw that Byron wasn't going to do anything to me for being smart, they all decided that they better not do anything either. I still got called Egghead or Poindexter or Professor some of the time, but that wasn't bad compared to what could have happened. The other thing that people could have teased me for a lot more was, if it weren't for Byron being my brother, was my eye. Mama said it wasn't important. I had been born with one of my eyeballs that was kind of lazy. This means that instead of looking where I tell it to look, it wants to rest in the corner of my eye next to my nose. I'd done lots of things to make it better, but none of them worked. I'd done exercises where I had to look that way and then this way and then this way and then that way and up and down and down and up, but... When I went to look in the mirror, my eye still went back to its corner. I wore a patch on my other eye to make the lazy one work, but that didn't do anything either. It was fun to play like I was a pirate for a little while, but that got boring. Finally, Byron gave me some good advice. He noticed that when I talked to people, I had squinch up my lazy eye, making it kind of shut, or I put my hand up over my face to cover it. I only did this because it's kind of got hard to talk to someone when they're staring at your eye instead of listening to what you have to say. Hey man, he told me, if you don't want people to look up your, at your messed up eye, you just got to do this. Byron made me stand still and look straight ahead. Then he stood on my side and he told me to look at him. So I turned my head to look. No, man. Keep your head straight and look at me sideways. I did it. See? You ain't cockeyed no more. Your eyes as straight as an arrow now. I went to the bathroom and I stood on the toilet and I leaned over into the mirror sideways and Byron was right. I couldn't help smiling. And Mama, she was right too. I was kind of handsome little guy when I looked at myself sideways and both my eyes were pointing in the same direction. So even though my brother was Clark Elementary School's God, it didn't mean I never got teased or beat up at all. I still had to fight a lot and I still got called cockeyed Kenny and I still had people stare at my eye and I still had to watch when they made their eyes go cross when they were teasing me. It seemed like one of these things happened to me every day. But if it hadn't been for Byron, I knew they would have happened a whole lot more. That's why I was kind of nervous about what was going to happen if Byron ever got out of sixth grade and went up to junior high before I caught up to him. That's why I was going to send off for that book, Learn Karate, in three weeks. That was at the back of my comic books. The worst part about being teased was riding the school bus on those mornings when Byron and Buphead decided they were going to skip school. We'd be standing on the corner waiting for the bus, Byron, Buphead, and all the other 
all the other thugs were in a bunch. Larry Dunn, Banky, and all the other younger thugs were in another bunch. And then the regular kids like Joetta were in a third bunch. And me was off to the side all by myself. When we saw the bus about three blocks away, we all got in a line. Old thugs, young thugs, regular kids, and then me. It wasn't until the bus stopped at the, and opened the door that I knew whether Byron and Buphead was going. I hated it when Bi would walk past and say, Give my regards to Clark Poindexter. Some of the time, those words were like a signal for the other kids to jump on me. But the day I stopped hating the bus so much began with those same words. We were all lined up. Give my regards to Clark Poindexter, Bi said, and he disappeared around the, ba the bus's back. I got on the bus and I took the seat right behind the driver. The days that Bi rode, I would sit a few rows from him at the back. On the other days, the driver was the most protection. The bus drove up down into the public housing, and after everyone was picked up, we headed towards Clark. But today, the bus driver did something he'd never done before. He noticed two kids running up late, and he stopped to let them get on. Now, every other time someone was late, he'd just laugh at them and tell the rest of us, This is the only way you little punks is going to learn to be punctual. I hope that fool has a pleasant walk to school. Then no matter how hard the late kid banged on the side of the bus, the driver would just take off laughing out the window. That was the part one of my miracle that let me know something really special was going to happen. As soon as the doors of the bus swung open, two strange new boys got on. And part two of my miracle happened. Only once in a while, Mama would make me go to Sunday school with Joey, even though it was just a bunch of singing and coloring and coloring books and listening to Mrs. Davidson. I had learned one thing. I learned about getting saved. I learned how someone could come to you when you were feeling really bad or really uh, feeling really, really bad and could take all your problems away and make you feel better. I learned that the person who saved you was your personal savior. He was sent to, by God to protect you and to help you out. When the bigger one of the two boys got on the bus late, the driver, he said to the driver in a real down south accent, Thank you for stopping, sir. I knew right away. I knew that God had finally gotten sick of me being teased and picked on all the time. As I looked at this new boy with a great big smile and the jacket with holes in the sleeves and the raggedy tennis shoes and the tore up jeans, I knew who he was. Maybe he didn't live a million years ago and maybe he didn't have a beard or long hair and maybe he wasn't born under, under a star, but I knew anyway. I knew God had finally sent me some help. I knew God had finally sent me my personal savior. As soon as the boy thanked the driver in that real polite, real country way, I jerked around in my seat to see what the other kids were going to do to him. Whenever someone new started coming to Clark, most of the kids took some time to see if they liked him. The boys would see if he was tough or weak, if he was cool or square, and the girls would look to see if he was cute or ugly. Then they decided how to treat him. I knew it wasn't going to take any time with this new guy. It was going to be real easy and real quick with him. He was like nobody we'd ever seen before. He was raggedy. He was country. He was skinny and he was smiling at everybody a mile a minute. The boy with him had to be his little brother because he looked like a sh shrunk up version of the big one. Everyone had stopped what they were doing and got real quiet. Some were standing up to get a better look. The older one got an even bigger smile on his face and waved real hard at everybody. The little shrunked up version of him smiled and did the same thing. Then they said, hi y'all. And I knew that here was someone who was going to be easier for the kids to make fun of than me. Most of the kids were just staring. 
Then Larry Dunn said, Lord, today, look at that nappy-headed down-home country cornflake that the cat dragged up from Mississippi, y'all. And about a million fingers pointed at the new kids, and a million laughs almost knocked them over. Larry Dunn threw an apple core from the back of the bus, and the new kid got his hand up just in time to block it from hitting him in the face. Little bits of apple exploded all over the kid and his brother and me. The other kids all went wild laughing and saying to each other, Hi, y'all! The bus driver jumped out of his seat, and he stood between the new kid and Larry Dunn. You see? You see how you kids is? This boy shows some manners and some respect, and all you want to do is attack him. That's why none y'all's ever going to be nothing. The bus driver was really mad. Larry Dunn, you better sit down and cut this mess out. I know you don't want me to start panning no folks, do ya? Not with what I know about your mama. Somebody said, ooh, and Larry sat down. The bus was real quiet. We had never seen the driver get this mad before. He pushed the two new kids into the same seat as me, and he told them, Don't you pay no mind to them little fools. They ain't happen, least they dragging somebody else down. Then he added, Y'all just sit here next to Poindexter. He don't bother nobody. I sat there and looked at them sideways. I didn't say anything to them, and they didn't say anything to me. But I was kind of surprised that God would send me a savior to me in such raggedy clothes. Well, Kenny didn't get beat up by Ryron in the, in the schoolyard, but he did finally meet his personal savior. We'll find out if they really do save him. Chapter 3 is called The World's Greatest Dinosaur War Ever. Can't wait to hear what that's all about. See you next time.